Robert just talked about all the characteristics of uh, negativity. Today, I want to talk about uh, how do we address this? How do we move beyond? How do we flush that stuff out of our minds for good? The first thing we have to do is understand that our thoughts are real and have actual anatomy. That our thoughts are real and have actual anatomy. I think sometimes we think because we can't see it, there's no physicality to it. Uh, but I want you to know that there's physicality to your thought life. I, I was reading an article, and I'm not a scientist or a biologist or a doctor, at least not medically, but th there were some things that talked about that kind of blew my mind a little bit as it relates to our thought life. I kind of thought that our thoughts, because we don't see them, that there there's nothing tangible about our thoughts. But that is not true. As I was reading this article, it talked about uh, these chemicals, these chemicals that, that, go, that, that come to life as we begin to think. And these chemicals create what is known as neurological uh, pathways. And it talked about how these neurological pathways, when we think, they, they activate these hormones which create um, uh, neuro. Uh, What's it? Neuro wiring. Neuro wiring. And, and what that is, it, it's kind of like it creates a, a, a railway for our thoughts to flow. Are you tracking with me? Th see, when we were born, we weren't born negative. When God created you, God did not create you to be a negative individual. But what has happened, the experiences that we have had, they have made us go negative. <laughs> The way we've responded to those experiences have caused us to go negative. And when we start down that path, our mind begins to dig a ditch. It's almost like when the rain flows. Uh, it, it finds its way to the lowest level. And we've dug these ditches in our minds by the way we have processed many of the events that have come our way. And no matter what happens, whether it's good or bad, even if it's a good thing, we can look at it and say, yeah, that's good. But we always find some kind of way to say, but. Yeah, God opened up this door and I got that brand new job, but they're not paying me all I wanted to make. Yes, I found this beautiful woman, but you know what? Mm, uh, she don't do her hair the way I like it. Or I found this guy, man, wonderful dude, man, but you know what? He don't make enough money for my taste. Y'all know y'all need to be saying amen. Y'all know y'all. Y'all y'all know y'all know sisters have met some nice brothers. But he's not making the kind of money you want to make. But, but, but we, 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 there's been this path that has been, been created in our minds by the way we process the, our past experiences that have caused us to go negative. I, I was reading this article, the same article, and it says this. Thoughts have a, uh, have a structure that occupies space in the brain. Thoughts and memories, which are known as neurons or nerve cells, resemble trees. Information that is dispersed from the five senses is processed in a certain area of the brain. Branches are then formed on the trees to hold this information in long-term memory. These branches, which are grown in the brain, create attitude, influences our decisions, and become part of who we are. Now, let, let me tell you what that all means. That means that we have got to stop entertaining some of these thoughts to come our way. Because these thoughts have uh, a, a anatomy. They, there's substance. There's, there's tangibility to these thoughts. And when you continue to allow these things to run over and over and over and over again in your mind, they create branches in your brain. And those branches grow leaves. <laughs> so you don't just have that bad thought anymore. You have the fruit of that thought in your head. So it's not just about the negative thing that happens. It's about everything that resembles that. You make it negative when it's not always a negative situation. So one of the first things we got to do is realize that when you have a thought, it is not just a thought. It's more to it 
than just a thought. That's why there's certain thoughts you have you just can't shake. Especially if you keep on focusing on it. So, number one is you got to understand that our thoughts are real and they have actual anatomy. The second thing is uh, we got to examine toxic thoughts by asking yourself, is this thought good for me? This thing that I'm entertaining, is, is this thing good for me? Is this helping me grow? Is it helping me mature? Is it helping me to be a better husband, a better wife? Is it, be is it helping me at all? Is this thought good for me? Now listen, there's, there's, there's some thoughts that come our way and we know this is a good thought. I need to act upon this. I need to respond to this in, in, a, in, a, in a positive way. But then there's some thoughts that come our way that we know we don't have no business whatsoever focusing on that thought. Can anybody say amen? Now, I know we can't, we can't control our thoughts. We can't stop certain things from coming to our minds. But we absolutely can control how long I'm going to think on that thing. How long am I going to focus on that thought? And so we have to become conscious aware we have to be aware of what's going on in our heads we got to stop allowing those evil thoughts those crazy thoughts those crazy birds that keep on flying over our heads you know we got to see thoughts kind of like birds you know if a, if a bird try to land on your head what are you going to do huh <laughs> somebody say run <laughs> that wouldn't be a bad thing but but if a bird tries to land on your head what you going to do you're going to swat it away well, we got to see that same requirement or respond the same way when those thoughts come our way that we know are destructive. There's some thoughts that have come my way, Sister Bernie, that as I'm thinking it, I know I should not be thinking about this. We got to take control of our thought lives. That's why in the book of Philippians, we read it last week, Philippians 4 and 8, it says this, summing it all up, friends. I say, you do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, on things noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise and not things to curse. You know what? Yes, there's nobody in this room who have not had a traumatic event happen to you in your past. But every single day, do you have to relive it? Do, do, you, do you have, is that thought, focusing on that, is that going to make you a better person today? Now listen, I'm not diminishing the fact that that happened to you. I'm not diminishing the fact that that stung and that it hurt and that it was painful. But guess what? I cannot go back and change what happened yesterday. There's nothing I can do about that person, about that thing, about those words. There's nothing I can do about that. But guess what? I can do a lot about today. And so we got to ask ourselves, is it true? Is it noble? Is it authentic? Is it compelling? Is it gracious? Is it going to bring about the best in me? Is it going to help me to be a beautiful person or is it going to make me an ugly person? Is it going to make me praise God or is it going to make me revolt against God? We got to do something about our thought lives. You know, Colossians says something that I think is interesting. Since you've been risen with Christ, since, since you've been risen with Christ, he says something. He says, set your mind. All right? Now, if you are a believer, what this text is saying, you have to deliberately begin to think upon things that are godly things. Let's bring it down to earth a little bit. We got to begin to think about godly things, not about the pain, not about the hurt, not about the frustration, not about the guilt, not about the shame, but we have to deliberately set our minds upon things they're going to help us grow and mature and honor Christ in the universe. That's a deliberate action. 
You know, they're, they're, uh, one of the perfect examples would, would be, how many of you ever change the channel on your television? Anybody ever do that? Anybody ever do that? All right, and uh, I guess a better example would be like it was back when I was a kid. Uh, Y'all remember when the knob used to fall off? <laughs> Y'all yeah, remember the knob used to fall The knob would fall off. So some of the young folk, they're looking at me, they don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the knob used to fall off. no remote control, you know. If the knob fall off, you're going to find you a pair of pliers. <laughs> it was a deliberate action. You had to get up out of your chair, walk towards that television, and change the channel with your pliers. And, 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 and I know your parents know, if you were anything like my dad, my dad used to be laying in the bed upstairs, screaming through the house, Lee! Tanita, Lee, Angie, y'all come here. We come upstairs running, think of something, you know, some kind of emergency or something. Hey, hey get them pliers over there and change that to you. Fun. <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Now, listen, listen, catch this. That same deliberate action of getting up and moving, that's what God is requiring of us to move beyond where we were, move beyond our past, take a deliberate action and change the channel of our lives. Uh, you know, because, you know, sometimes we take on that victim mentality. What they did to me, they hurt me. There ain't nobody in this room that haven't been hurt. There's not, there's not one person in this room that has not been victimized. There's not one person in this room that has not had some traumatic event happen to you where you could just lay down and do nothing the rest of your life and blame somebody else for your failure. Everybody in this room has had that kind of experience. But thanks be unto God, some of us have, have realized that God gives us the victory. And so we won't take on that mentality of being victims. We realize that we are more than conquerors. Yeah, you did me dirty, you did me wrong, but you know what? It's okay because yet I rise. And not because of my own strength. Well, because God is good to me. See, but, but again, because of the anatomy that goes on in our heads, when we go negative, that is not an easy thing to do. We have to make deliberate decisions every day to believe the report of the Lord. All right? Every single day, we have to make a deliberate decision that I will believe the report. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? There have been all kinds of negative things that have been spoken over your life. But you made a decision that, God, I believe you, Lord. I trust you. I know what your word says about me. I grab hold of that, and they can say what they want. It don't mean nothing to me because, God, I have a sure word from you. Man, I got to take this off. Y'all excuse me for not wearing a tie today. Today, one tie Sunday. Somebody said, where would you want to wear? Praise God. But listen, catch this. Someone said that it takes between 21 and 28 days to form a new habit. Well, there's no scientific data that actually supports that. What we found out is it takes anywhere from between 18 days and five months to create a new habit. We have data for that. And on average, it, it, on average, it takes about 66 days to form a new habit. Now, if you habitually go negative, you got to start today developing new habits. <laughs> I hope y'all listen to what I'm saying. Somebody said, by Easter, we're going to be okay. But you can't keep on delaying saying, well, tomorrow I'm going to start working on this. 
in this room today, we got people you need to start right now saying, guess what? I got 66 more days. And in 66 days, I'm going to be a positive individual. Now listen, you can't do that in your own strength. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. It's our cooperation with the Holy Spirit that's going to bring about that transformation. Let me tell you something. You ain't going to pray this into happening. You, you ain't going to speak in tongues and all of a sudden you be a positive individual. I just want you to know that. God's not going to do it that way. What God is going to do or what he is requiring is that we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, work through the process, and let me tell you why he does it that way. Because at the end of the day, you will appreciate it so much more knowing the struggle that you had to go through to overcome that negativity. Number three, you got to do something with that thought now. Number three, you got to do something about the negative thoughts. Can't let them fly over your head. Can't let them land on your head. You have to actively accept those things which are good. And you have to actively reject those things which you know are bad for you. It's the active things. You are not passive in this process. Can y'all can y'all repeat after me? I am not passive in this process. Are you tracking with me? That means you're not gonna sit back and say, God, when you make me positive, I'm gonna be positive. I'm going to sit right here, God, until I no longer have these negative thoughts. And when you free me of this, Lord, I'm going to walk in liberty. Let me tell you, if you take that stance, you're going to be negative till you die. Because the Bible says that God has given us everything necessary for what? For life and godliness. He's not dropping out of the sky to do what he told you to do. The Bible says he told us to mortify the deeds of the flesh. I'm not going to mortify the deeds of your... God said he's not going to mortify those deeds. He said, I'm giving you my spirit. And with the spirit I provide, with the strength I provide you, mortify the deeds of the flesh. Now, I heard this before, and I'm just going to speak to it. Someone told me that they just had... A negative demon. They just had a negative demon. And, and I had to tell them, you may have a lion's demon, but you ain't got no negative demon. You ain't no negative. See, what happens, if you can say that it's a demon, now you don't have to do the work. All you got to do now is just cast it out and you're going to be okay. And when I'm telling you, that is a lie. You don't have no negative demon. What you have is an unleashed flesh that needs to be tamed, that needs to be brought into subjection of the Holy Spirit and be purged of that thing. Now let's just say amen. Now when you said amen, you just said, I agree. So we ain't praying for you to have deliverance over your negativity. We're praying that you submit. Everybody say submit. That you submit your thought life to the Holy Spirit and allow him to change you day by day. I was telling the leaders this morning, you know, sometimes I'm living life and, you know, I get into this rut where I'm just negative. And my wife or my kids will say, Daddy, oh, Lee, why are you so negative? Why you been, why all that, why you, why does it require all that negativity? And I have to shut myself down, change the train tracks. <laughs> all right, go get the pliers, change the channel, and begin to live out of my new nature. Are you tracking with me? I can't sit there and say, well, that's a demon, y'all. Y'all got to keep on praying for me. Yeah, y'all, yeah, y'all do need to pray for me. But you need to pray for my submission to the Holy Spirit. Are you tracking me? The Holy Spirit got more power than we give him the credit for. Are you tracking me? He got more power. The devil, devil can't put nothing on me like that. 
Why? Because I, God is the sovereign God of the universe. You know what I'm saying? He's the maker of the heavens and earth. He has taken me out of the kingdom of darkness and brought me into the kingdom of the son that he loves. He has established gates around me that the enemy, no matter how hard he tried, he can never get his hands on me to destroy me. Why? Because my life is hid with God in Christ. And no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that comes against me... God always leads me into triumph. So we stop trying to be victims. We, we cut that out and realize that we, look at somebody and say, we, get, we have responsibility. Look at somebody and say, we have responsibility. Yeah, if you, if you can blame it on a demon or blame it on somebody else, then you can just take your hands off of it. But we got to realize something, that we got to do something about those thoughts. The Bible says, in, and I'm not going to read this right now because time getting away from me. In 2 Corinthians 10 and 5, it talks about taking every thought captive. Taking every, can y'all repeat after me? Taking every thought captive. Every thought, every good thought, every bad, take it all captive. Because what I got to be able to do is judge whether this thought is good for me. So I'm going to pay attention to all my thoughts. Number four, we have to build new memories over the old. We, we got to build some new memories over the old. Hey, listen, is there anybody in here, I want y'all to be honest, is there anybody in here who does not have a past? <laughs> Raise your hand if you don't have a past. Is there anybody here that don't have some junk back in your past? Is there anybody here who don't have something in your past that you don't want the rest of us to know about? I, go ahead, raise your hand. I want to see you. Because you've been living, <laughs> I don't know where you've been living. I, I don't know. You must have been in a padded room all your life or something. But every single individual in this room, we have a past. And there's some things that we have done. Now catch this. There are some things that have been done to us that we don't want no one to know about. They are painful. They hurt. They are real. They have anatomy. They have affected us in crazy ways. But you know what? That's still no excuse to be negative. If my past has been bad, I want my future to be glorious. So what that means, Vonetta, is that every single day, I'm going to do something that's going to lead to the praise and exaltation of who God is. I'm going to plant a seed that's going to come up later on in my life that's going to ensure that I have a glorious future. If I want my future to be glorious, I got to stop planning bad seed. If you keep planning what you've been planning, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. If you keep on hanging on to what happened to you in the past, then you are allowing your past to dictate your future. Look at your neighbor and say, your brain can grow. <laughs> your, your brain can grow. That means you can create new memories, new neurons that hold your new memories. And guess after a while, after I keep on experiencing the glories of Christ and living this life that God has called me to, eventually my good days are going to outweigh my bad days. And yet a little while, my, my good memories are going to outweigh all my bad memories. But guess what? I got to do something today that ensures that today I'm putting something new in the ground. Now, let, let, let me tell you what the blood of Jesus does. God takes red blood put it on my black sinful life 
and makes me white as snow. God takes red blood, put it on my dark thought life, and purges or purifies my mind. See, that's what the atoning work of Jesus Christ was all about. Not just to save you, but to cleanse you. Because there are some things that we struggle with that's not about my sin, nor is it about your sin. There's some things we struggle with that's about sins that have been done to us. Can I talk about this for a second? Statistically, just by the numbers in this room, there's somebody in here who, who has been sexually abused. Statistics alone prove that. There, there's somebody in this room that has been in a very hurtful relationship, painful relationship, physically as well as verbally. That there's somebody in this room who has struggled with a drug addiction. Statistics alone, I know it to be true. That there's somebody in this room who have struggled with sexual identity issues. I know that to be true just by statistics alone. There's somebody in this room that has possibly been sexually abused by an uncle or an aunt or a father or somebody that you know that's did. I know that. Statistics alone tells me that. Now, if, let me tell you something else I know about that room. I, I know about that based upon statistics alone. That there's somebody in this room that has abused someone. There's somebody in this room who has assaulted someone. And we don't want to talk about that in church. We want to act like, oh, we've been praising God and thanking God all my life. But I know by statistics alone that we got people in this room that have been victims and have been victimized. And I want to tell you, no matter where you fall, or, that the grace of God is sufficient. We be both need the same grace. Whether you are the victim or you are the victimized, we need the same grace. And if you are the victimized, let me tell you something. You repent to God and the person you victimize. Don't even worry about the jail scenario. If you did it, if that's the consequence, you take it. Why? Because you want to be whole. God will give you a peace to endure whatever you got to endure. God's grace will be sufficient. Don't even worry about that. It's more important that you're pure before God. And if you have been victimized, give that thing to God. God's grace is so sufficient. Because you've been victimized and you've been living your life thinking, what did I do to deserve this? What did I do to edge that individual on? What, what did I do? What, what happened? And this is real talk here. This is the real deal. This is where we live. I know this based upon statistics alone. And I'm telling you, it is not your fault. It is not your fault. God has not abandoned you. God loves you. You don't have to walk in shame you don't have to sit here and wonder what is it about me that makes me unworthy of love i'm telling you today that while you were dead when you were a mess jesus died for you he was there the whole while he didn't wait till you were perfected But when you were at your lowest state, God commended his love towards you. And let me tell you something else. You had that experience. It was painful. And I know it hurt. I know it hurt. I know it was painful. But let me tell you this. God is giving you a testimony. He is trusting you with a testimony, my sister, that transcends anything that you would have been able to say to be affected in this universe. And now, listen, there are people in this room right now that you've had some bad situations happen to you, and now you're saying right now, you say, God, I thank you. 
Now, people outside, they're like, what well, so-and-so happened to you? How, how you thinking God? You thinking God because you know right now, today, God, I, you know that God brought you out. And also, you know God has put a word in your mouth for all the other hurting people. Now you're able to speak life. You're able to speak hope. You're able to say to them, yes, that happened to you. But guess what? God is faithful. God is a deliverer. God is a keeper. God is a sustainer. And you're able to say today that God has allowed me to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I want you to be free today, saints. If we're going to detox this thing, let's detox it all the way down. Let's deal with all the dirt, all the crud, all the foolishness. Bring it all up so we can let that junk go and walk in the fullness and the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at somebody and say, we're going to change the world. We're going to change the world. And we don't change the world but not dealing with truth. We don't change the world but not dealing with truth. We got to deal with it. Okay, listen. There's one more. Go ahead. Let the girl rejoice. Let her rejoice. She's not disrupting me. Listen, if you've been through what she's been through, if you had to endure some of the things she had to endure, and I don't even know it all, but if you had to deal with that, then guess what? You'll be rejoicing as well, knowing how good God's been to you. And how faithful he is. And how God's a keeper. She determined to go back a different way. Let it bubble up. Let it come on out. Let it come on out. Yeah. Okay, let me give you one more. Let me give you, let me give you number five. Let me give you number five. See, let me say this, y'all. See, this is what revival is all about. It's not about foaming at the mouth, speaking in tongues, rolling on the floor. What revival is about, God doing something on the inside and causing that filth to come on up and come on out. To empty you of all that foolishness so he can fill you with his presence. Every single day, we have to delve into the word of God. Let the word of God be our meditation day in and day out. Because we got to replace that negativity with something. And let me tell you something, cliches aren't that powerful. And yet we fill our heads with all these cliches. They don't mean nothing. There's no power. There's no substance to it. We got to fill our heads with the word of God. Listen. Psalms 119 and 9 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to the word. Let, let me give you a very practical thing that I do. I love promise books. I love them. I probably have about 15 to 20 of them. My favorite ones I borrowed about 15, 20 years ago from my father. I'm going to give them back to you one day, Daddy. So I didn't steal them. I borrowed them. <laughs> His name all through them, but praise God. Yeah, yeah, that's where, that's where it's been. But you can buy these things for like five dollars. Even today, you can find these things for a dollar. These things cover just about anything you can just about imagine. Uh, when I was down pastoring at another church, they experienced a lot of pain, a lot of hurt at that church, and I just went there just preaching the gospel praying that God would bring about healing in that ministry. And we bought a bunch of these, and we used to just pass them out on Sundays. My wife and I would go every weekend and buy five or ten of these and just give them away on Sunday morning because we know it's the Word of God that changes people's 
lies. Are you tracking with me? For instance, do you feel insecure? It takes you to Deuteronomy 33 and 27. It says, the eternal God is a dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. I, I know that's breathing hope in somebody's life right now, that you know you he, his arms are undergirding you. Let, let me give you another one. Catch this. Psalms 46 and 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help. You feeling insecure? You read something like that, knowing that God is a present help today? I don't have to wait till tomorrow. I don't have to wait till this afternoon, but he's a present help right now? Can I give you another one? Proverbs 14 and 26. It says, in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. Now, when you feel insecure, inadequate, when you're walking in guilt, you're walking in shame, when you think about all that negativity from your past, if you have a convenient book like this in your briefcase, in your purse, all you got to do is pull it out. Enemy, I know what you're trying to say. But this is what God says. Are you tracking with me? Now it's only a matter of whose report will I believe? Who, who am I going to believe? Am I going to believe the report of the Lord? Or am I going to believe what the enemy has been speaking to me through individuals?